Hello, Maria. Hi, everyone. I'm behind the cameras today. Um, we decided just to have a little of a different view on Mark. <clears throat> and this coffee and tea is going to be uh, without coffee and tea because I just grabbed Mark in the studio and put the camera in front of him. And we're going to talk today, Mark, about... Oh, those precious areas. Of which you have destroyed many. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's... You're reading my mind because I was just thinking prior to this discussion that I probably spent more than half of my life in the studio practice, that is, creating and destroying precious areas. Hmm. So why did you want to talk about it? Well, because it always comes up with my discussions with other artists, and now that I'm doing these mentorships and these critiques, it just constantly is coming up. You know, <clears throat> and if I could share a brief anecdote to start kick it off, um, years ago, um, I was living in West Oakland. This is right after grad school. And I was working on a four foot by five foot painting, Maria. Really pretty good size in oil. Had been at it for quite some time and I thought I was done. But I wasn't quite sure. So I went down the hall to ask uh, a neighbor friend of mine, Kim Ono. I'm gonna bring Kim into this, drop in names now, who now teaches at CCA. Anyway, I asked Kim to come take a look. Uh, I trusted her eye. She came in, she took a look at it. And she said, this is a really nice painting, but there's something about that upper right quadrant that, I don't know, it's just something's going on there. I'm not sure. And she leaves. Well, she had nailed that one of the most precious areas of my painting that I was refusing to let go of. And then I get rid of it in my mind's eye and I'm thinking, Jesus, she's, she's right. So I modified it. I don't recall if I got rid of it, Maria, but I modified it and it worked better. The point is, is that trying to trying to read the whole painting is tricky when we get caught up with these little precious details that we just fell in love with, like jewels that we've, you know, taken and put into our treasure chest and never want to let go of. And yet, as most painters who are out there listening to me right now, they fully understand what I'm talking about. They have to be modified or they have to go away. Can the painting be brought to the precious area? Great question. The answer is absolutely yes. Particularly if the precious areas, and I've also, but the, okay, the short answer there is yes, you can. You can create some precious areas, but if you have too many precious areas, this is the problem that people run into. A lot of artists that I'm talking with now, they've just got too many little precious areas and they have to start deciding which ones are gonna stay and which ones are gonna go. And the ones that you keep, that's a great question. Yes, because what, what's going on in the artist's mind is, you know, they're looking at the painting, they're reading it, and they love a certain area, or they love a certain passage. And they say, I say to myself, I want to keep that. There's something there I want to keep. I would rather work on areas to support that than to change it or to eradicate it. And so one does one's best to do that. I'm doing it right now. This is a piece in progress. I've got some interesting areas. Something's got to go, you see, for the better of the whole. And that's and that's what that's the problem that a lot of art, a lot of artists run into. They don't know what to let go of. So it becomes an issue of letting go, killing something that you fell in love with. Not easy. Can the whole painting, in a way, be precious in that sense that you know that something is wrong, but like the whole thing is not working? I would say a short answer to that question, and it's another good question, is no, because I believe in having a hierarchy of importance in the painting. I'm a big proponent of that. I teach it, I profess it. Well, what does that mean to have hierarchy of importance? It means that one way to say it that I often say, Marie, is if everything is important, nothing's important. If everything is wanting our attention in the same fashion or in equal fashion, then it's, it's, then nothing's really important. An analogy I use on this is an orchestra. Because what we're doing here is we're, I'm orchestrating visual elements into a whole that hopefully is harmonious, balanced, and unified. 
So the analogy I like to use is an actual orchestra with all the parts, percussion, horns, woodwinds, etc. And the conductor comes out to conduct, let's say, a beautiful Mozart piece. And for some odd reason, the uh, unspoken reason, the orchestra doesn't like this conductor. In fact, they hate this conductor. And so they've decided to mutiny. And what does that mean? It means they're all going to play full blast on every part because the conductor is oftentimes quieting down the sections and bringing up other sections to give that hierarchy. And if they all start going full blast, Mozart's piece is a disaster. There's no hierarchy of importance. The same thing is true here. I'm the conductor trying to orchestrate this and I'm trying to subdue certain parts while bringing up other parts. Some parts get to shine and other parts have to settle down. No. That's one way of explaining it, if that makes sense. It makes me think now or wonder, um, well, when a painting is resolved and balanced and you're happy with it, yeah. in a way it is that everything is important or that nothing is important, like that orchestra, right? Like if every element does have a place, which is an important place, but nothing is sticking out. Yeah. So I'm kind of putting a spin onto what you just said, that yeah. you know maybe everything needs to be equally important, or do you feel that in a painting there is still a main actor and then the supporting acts around it? which means that there is that precious area or that precious moment that is carrying the weight of the painting. Well said, and the answer is yes, and I'll add to that. So a painting can have a number of areas that are catching our attention in different degrees. So these are areas that we've given importance to, either for color or for a thick line. Uh, these are the visual elements that we give, it could be texture, could be shape, so yes, a painting can have a number of focal points, but if all the focal points, so to speak, are of equal attention, there's you have bed, you have bedlam. Where does the eye go to? How does the eye? How is the eye being directed? And we just kind of you know we we all have heard this uh, comment, this critical comment of looking at a painting, Maria, and saying it's just too busy. And when it's too busy, then we we don't have that hierarchy, and so we can't read the piece as a whole, we are getting caught up on looking at little sections too soon. And in a good painting, you can have a complex design. Think of Hieronymus Bosch. I mean, that's a very complex design, what he does. But there's still this remarkable sense of the unified aspect of all the parts equally in the whole, so that when we look at the painting, when we work into the gallery, we don't see the parts, we see the whole and it feels unified. If a certain area of red is too red, it doesn't work. If a line is way too thick, it pops out. You know, if the white is too white, it doesn't work. You know, when you think of uh, some of those painters like Whistler and Sargent who would work with off-whites and then get that one little bit of white on the cuff of the sleeves, like, whoa, that is perfect. You know, that's that precious moment that's really working because everything else is supporting it. And so, yeah, you can have more than one for sure, but every, all the parts have to support those in, in a way that they don't draw attention to themselves unnecessarily. I think that for someone who doesn't know your teaching and maybe is not as familiar with your vocabulary. The language, yeah. Yes, um, this might sound confusing. I think we're going back and forth mm -hmm. on maybe, um, using certain terms in different contexts. Yeah. So I'm going to just try to, because I know you, to reiterate what you were trying to talk about when talking about the precious areas and yes. getting rid of them and yes. letting go of them. Yeah. Um, so if um, a precious area is something that is not quite working, but you find it for whatever reason beautiful or appealing, mm -hmm. And then everything around it is telling you, no, it doesn't belong here. Like, for example, you would tell me sometimes you will put a, a beautiful letter or a piece of paper that yeah. is really precious to you. You don't want to cover it, but you feel like you have to cover it. Yes. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah. Or part of it? That's, that's a lot of what we're talking about. And I'm thinking, too, that uh, this is something that one of my mentors 
uh, Irma Cabot, when I was 20 years old, learning how to work from European masters, said to me, and she said, ideally, the artist keeps the viewer's eye moving throughout the picture and they don't exit. They're always, and there are framing devices that can be used to do that. But that ideally, there's a directional thrust or movement that the viewer takes when one, quote, reads the work. You know, first you see the piece as it is, oh, there's a landscape. Next thing you know, you're going into it and you're seeing the man in the boat and, and you're seeing the cows in the distance or whatever it might be, but you're reading it and you're moving throughout, all right? So if there is a precious area that's just too eye-catching and you get stuck there, then it's hard to move through the rest of the painting, you see. And that's part of the problem with the precious areas. You see right now, I've got a battle going on between this and this. You see, they're both grabbing and wanting my attention. Something's got to be sublimated or changed so that there's a better, what I call earlier, a hierarchy. So does that help Maria understand this idea of moving throughout the painting and not getting stuck or drawn to a visual element that's so strong you kind of can't get out of there? Mm -hmm. So another way of a precious area is just something that is sticking out yeah. way too much or drawing too much attention. And yes. maybe we like it and maybe we don't, which just makes yes. it easier or harder to get rid of. Right. And can you either can keep that precious area and make the supporting actors support it better? Or if the supporting actors are really what you want also in the painting, then the so-called precious area has to be sublimated or sometimes eradicated. Okay. Yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to say about this? Hmm. Um, perhaps. I was just working uh, with an artist today, this morning, um, in one of my uh, mentorship uh, relationships, and we came upon this very subject. And so oftentimes I talk about the beginning of a painting, the middle phase and the end phase, and how those are different and what it feels like. And when we were critiquing her work, because um, she's sending me the phases of the work, including where she thinks he is now, which is near the end. And we were looking at a middle phase in which she's making decisions, what stays and what goes. And we both agreed after I pointed it out to her, Maria, that too early in the process, she was thinking small parts and bits and pieces rather than the whole. And whereas she could have made a big move to sort of um, make all the parts start to come together, she's nitpicking way too soon. And that's how you create sometimes precious areas. Like, oh, let me put a little yellow here and a little beautiful uh, emerald there too early in the game. So one of the phrases I've scrawled on my wall that I used to have in Venetia is to start as a stonemason and end as a jeweler. The idea being that you go from general to specific oftentimes and that you kind of create a scaffold or a foundation. It doesn't matter if it's abstract or figurative. And then all those juicy little details and emeralds and even precious areas can come in later in the phase so that you're not so afraid to change things. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? I think that covers it. Precious areas. <laughs> all right. I'll just jump here to say thank you. This was a little bit of a different format, just right. trying it out for fun. She caught me here in the studio. And we, <laughs> we've been talking about having this conversation, so here yeah. we are. Thank you everyone for watching. Uh, this was another coffee and tea without coffee and tea this time, <laughs> but sending you a big hello from Mark Studio. Greetings.